Thank you for the invitation and honor. I'm truly delighted to be here today at a conference honoring Benoit, a common friend. Uh, he has already been showered with uh, compliments. Um, I have nothing to add, I share all of them, so it's just wonderful. Uh, instead, I would like to share with you a few thoughts about current challenges uh, for central banking. Let me say right away that it's not incumbent upon me uh, to give good and bad grades to the departing team or to uh, pontificate in front of the new one. I selected four challenges, two policy-related ones and two more institutional ones on which I'm going to spend more time. So let me start with the boring stuff while you are eating, um, which are the challenges for traditional central banking. Most of you in this room and myself have rehashed the various challenges that confront central banks. The need to resist the siren's call for banking deregulation when the situation comes down. The need to undo doom loops, which logically developed in the wake of the European crisis and have been tolerated since. And relatedly, the inefficient risk sharing and the disconnect between a single monetary policy and banks which are still largely national. The challenge posed by uh, central, uh, shadow banking, not by central banking, by shadow banking, which naturally benefits from the migration of economic activity as supervisors tighten regulatory constraints on commercial banks. The need for a greater international collaboration in supervision and resolution at a time when multilateralism doesn't fly high anymore. The completion of the banking union and the exit from low interest rates. On the latter point, let me note that central banks had no choice but run unconventional monetary policies, yet these have very well-known cost. Low interest rates are conducive to the emergence of bubbles, uh, to risk-taking through search for yield. They imply a massive transfer of wealth from uh, savers to borrowers. They also increase inequality by making owners of assets richer, they are an addictive drug for governments, which can painlessly expand their balance sheet, at least in the short run. And they, are, of course, have their own limitation when they hit the lower bound, when the natural rate of interest lies below zero. And we economists, of course, um, have to work hard and anticipate more, find concrete and more effective ways of addressing these complex issues. And in this respect, I'm delighted to see that some central banks in Europe have beefed up their research capabilities, both internally and in collaboration with top research universities. This certainly will contribute to keeping talent in Europe and making European economics research and policy making more innovative. So that was the obvious stuff. Uh, let me move on to the second challenge, which is the digital economy. Um, it's hard to speak at an event honoring Benoit uh, without mentioning digital money. Um, of course, I'm going to cover some of the same themes uh, as Lyle earlier. Many central banks, uh, including the ECB, have correctly pointed out the high potential of new technologies such as blockchain, at least uh, if we succeed in moving away from uh, energy-intensive proof proof of work, and perhaps finding uh, reliable uh, proof of stake approaches. But they also have insisted on the drawbacks of cryptocurrencies. Pushing at open doors, I'll just remind you of those drawbacks. The facilitation of money laundering, crime, and tax evasion. The waste or prioritization of seniorage. The challenges cryptocurrencies pose for capital controls the handling of rents on a traditional currency and the conduct of counter-cyclical monetary policy, and the possible blaming of authorities as small investors are exposed to hacking on cryptocurrency exchanges, forking, burst of the cryptocurrency bubble, and finally, in the case of stable coins, misrepresentation about their backing. On the last point, teaser is a salutary reminder that stable coins like Libra may lack collateral in safe assets. It more generally raises the question of who will prudentially supervise and act as a lender of last resort.
for such global currencies. As Ben Wise emphasized, cryptocurrencies and stable coins offer a wake-up call to central banks, which has honestly been outpaced. Economic agents are looking for cheap and fast payment devices. And of course, central banks can create their own digital currency. The question still remains as to whether central banks, digital currencies will offer narrow or broad access. The latter option, in which access is granted to wholesale um, and retail depositor, not just financial institution, creates a risk of disintermediation of the banking system. This will seem to go against the standard precepts that not all deposits are meant to be safe, safe that is protected from billionability, or short-term, that is being demandable. It also runs counter to the observation that banks perform transformation and cum delegated monitoring function that the central bank doesn't have the expertise to duplicate. Now the central, the People's Bank of China seems to have opted for the narrow option with its share stating that the new digital currency is not meant to replace deposit held in bank accounts and balances held by payment apps such, such as Alipay and WeChat. What options will be selected in the rest of the world? I don't know. But with Benoit's BIS appointment, this dossier is in the best possible hands. Next, I would like to share with you. Yeah, you're so calm. This is wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. This is the worst possible thing to be giving a talk while people are having lunch. But you know, I, you're admirable, to be honest. Um, next, I would like to share with you some concern about two institutional challenges for central bank. The loss of independence and a possible mission creep. They apparently are opposite concerns. You know, loss of independence means less control, mission creep means more control. But they're actually related if the latter is a strategy uh, to avert the former. So let me start with independence. There's been a number of recent suggestions to reaffirm the primacy of politics in public decision making. Officially in India, the US, Italy, and more generally Europe, Turkey, and other countries have questioned their central bank's independence. And by the way, no authority in independent agency is really independent, not fully independent. Their mission is always defined by the, the politics, by politicians, so as uh, per periodic reviews. Now, for central banks, a facilitating factor for this attack on independence is, of course, that the line between fiscal and monetary policy has become very thin. But this is part of a more general trend. The independence of competition authorities and of the judiciary is also being questioned in some countries. Maybe we should remind ourselves of why we have independent agencies in the first place. Historically, the rise of independent agencies grew out of a discontent with the political process. Politics, indeed, are subject to heavy lobbying, capture, and lectioneering. For instance, central banks were made independent to tame inflation and later on to avoid lax supervision, lax prudential supervision. Relatedly, independent regulatory authorities set up to oversee the telecoms, electricity, and other network industries, and the judicial review applied since the early 20th century to US public utilities, which, by the way, are private companies, were meant to protect private investors in those utilities from an expropriation through low prices, or conversely, to protect consumers from abusive tariffs or lack of competition in non-natural monopoly segments. A corollary to independence is its great, greater acceptance of evidence-based public decision-making. Consequently, in, consequently, independent agencies are more often populated with high expertise staff, for example, PhDs or the like. Now, the broader context is a population and politicians' disarray. People dismiss experts. They want change. They look for someone who has a plan. Lo and behold, lo and behold, the political market responds to that demand. And the politician's response is not always glamorous. 
They may pass the buck asking corporations to substitute for government. Of course, there is nothing wrong with socially responsible investment, but socially responsible investment inherently follows a decentralized approach. And I cannot help noting the incongruity that arises when governments do not dare to price carbon, yet ask businesses to, to act as if. Governments may also pretend to act when not acting, as when they engage in window dressing or greenwashing. The acclaimed COP21 agreement embodied only vague promises and a collective one for the Green Fund, following a deliberate strategy to build a consensus among 196 countries on the least common denominator. Of course, politicians cannot claim a monopoly on pseudo 86 and malls. A pride counterpart to COP21 is a business roundtable 2019 statement, which doesn't offer much in terms of concrete actions. And finally, when acting, governments often favor administered approach and la labyrinthine systems, which gives the impression they know what they are doing and are in control. I here have in mind command and control in environmental matters, ill-guided industrial policy that doesn't obey best practice, administrative layoff controls, etc. What all those targeted policies have in common is that they require information that officials do not have. Finally, I would like to say a few words about mission creep. The second institutional hazard for an agency is a loss of its sense of mission. Again, we must go back to the basic principles. Governments are the ultimate stakeholder society. Their, missions, their mission is multiple and possibly fuzzy. What objective function are they trying to optimize? This is unavoidable, and they should not be assigned blame for it. Yet, this complex mission, together with limited voter understanding and information, makes it difficult for the electoral process to hold officials accountable for their performance. Agency, by contrast, have the ability to develop a sense of mission. And professional and narrow specialists, I insist narrow specialists, professionals, are instrumental in creating this sense of mission internally and intertemporal consistency and legal certainty externally. As agency theory shows, clear missions and advocacy create focus and accountability. They also reduce the likelihood of challenge to the agency's independence. This sense of mission should not be tainted by each and every consideration. It should not be polluted through consideration that can be dealt with other proper instruments. For example, inequality, which is one of the great challenges of our time, is best, best addressed through fiscal redistribution, better education, universal health care, and other instruments. But the carbon price, which is by far the best known instrument to address global warming, or tobacco taxation should not go through the window on the ground that they may hurt the poor. All the more that compensation, for example, an energy check, can address uh, the distributional concern, the distributional concern very easily. Not to mention the fact that many popular climate micro policies are more regressive than a carbon price. PV panel can be installed only if you are a homeowner. Electric cars are not repurchased by the poor. There recently have been many calls to make the ECB greener. I assume that prudential supervision and collateral definition is what most people have in mind. Here, there is a good the bad, and the uncertain. I fully concur with a number of you in this room, and in particular Francois Villeroy, with this observation that climate change should be embodied in our economic forecast, our stress test, and our assessment of collateral accepted by the central bank. Climate change will create macro shocks, damages, energy transition, high carbon prices, and stranded assets, whose likely size grows every day 
as we keep substituting green posturing for actual action. It is useful to consider, as the Bank of France does and other central banks do, various scenarios in order to predict the evolution of banking and insurance liabilities as the fight against global warming unfolds. On the dark side, let's set aside the environmental version of modern monetary theory. EMMT provides a narrative and motivated beliefs to those who care about the environment but refuse to pay for it. More relevant is EU Vice President Dombrovskis' proposal to cut the capital charges imposed on banks' climate-friendly lending. This is well-meaning, but to me it seems misguided for a couple of reasons. The first is the obvious point that Europe can avail itself of a much more efficient instrument, a high enough carbon price, and refuse to employ this instrument, at least on a sufficient scale and scope. I think that European policy in this respect is wrong, but one may feel uneasy about the central bank's use of an inferior instrument and taking charge of a policy, climate change mitigation, that was officially endorsed but implicitly rejected by Europe, European politicians. Second, green projects are individually risky and especially subject to macro risk. One cannot help being concerned that such a policy might create a banking crisis. Third, the prime with green project is not the availability of financing, but rather the lack of income prospects associated with our failure to give a proper price to carbon emissions. Fourth, it is important to identify what is green and what is not. And I will return to that topic in a minute. In the gray zone stands, stand calls for the ECB to commit to gradually eliminating carbon intensive assets from its portfolio, starting with immediate divestment from coal related assets. Put differently, such call remind the ECB of its social responsibility in front of the twin market and political failure. Some will object to this position for one of the reasons I used to criticize the relaxation of prudential standard for green lending. The central bank takes over prerogatives that traditionally belong to the political realm. Well taken, but it's also hard to disagree with policies that stigmatize coal. Regardless of how we see it, we should remember that our moral duty is to eliminate coal, not to pretend we do. While a modest carbon price of 40 euros per ton of CO2 will by itself imply the dis disappearance of much European coal, admittedly replaced by gas, which pollutes a lot, but only half of coal, we must acknowledge that while divestment has expressive content, expressive content, its efficacy is limited by the leakage prime. It has little impact if other investors jump at the opportunity of undervalued fossil fuel stocks and bonds. This was expressed in perhaps a too extreme a form by Bill Gates, who argued that campaigns to ditch fossil fuel stocks are a total waste of time. It also has no impact, divestment also has no impact if the plants already exist, as they do not need financing. In such cases, only a carbon price will do. So I'm not against this policy, but we have to realize that it's really a third best kind of approach. Another issue is that we need to develop a better understanding of the exclusion versus best in class choice. So I mentioned gas, gas is dirty but it may make sense in the transition, right? And what about nuclear? Okay, nuclear is not meant to be green, but it's an essential component of the transition and limit the damages that will occur before we have better solutions. And even about oil companies, if you think about it, if we exclude them, they will have no incentive to actually invest in technologies that reduce their emissions during extraction and refining. Now, I'm not saying we should do that, and the bottom line, and the big bottom line, is that I just don't know. 
I just don't know. So anyone who has certainties about the topic, I would like to have a discussion and I would like to learn more about this. This brings me to a broader point. Ethical looking investments are still too often unrelated to impact. As an economist, I feel that ethical actions are those who make a difference. Posture should not be part of our moral compass. The predictable discovery that likable private policies such as carbon offsets and public ones such as the clean development mechanisms, by the way, the clean development mechanisms anticipated that and had an emphasis on additionality, those policies often fail to reduce carbon emissions. And this is a warning call. Such policies too often create a windfall gain for projects which will have taken place anyway, or whose direct impact is nullified by carbon leakage. On a more positive side, I think that a key challenge of which governments, central banks, the finance sector, and academics. We need to define ECG criteria, ESG criteria, I'm sorry, that reflect actual impact and not narratives. And in the end, a greater social responsibility is perhaps to, aid, to educate populations and to put pressure on governments to start behaving in a responsible manner. To conclude, let me thank you again for having me on this special occasion. Thank you, Benoit, for all you did for our country, Europe, during, during the last eight years. And we are delighted that you will remain engaged in public service, and I wanted to wish you bon vent. <laughs>